Hello there. Oh, my cat wants to join the picture. Come on, you want to be in the show? <laughs> All right, hello there. Buddha Jen and Bear. You're not aware there's a camera here. Bear, look at the camera. Nope. Anyway, uh, Bear and I uh, lived together in my Tacoma truck. Uh, had a little shell in the back, and uh, we camped inside the camped on the street from the uh, summer of 2014 until what was it, October 2019. So yeah, we spent five years out there together, and uh, during that time, I um, tried several ways to get off the street and uh, find some sort of employment. Well, not really employment. I'm an artist. I was trying to figure out how to make money. I threw a tournament in uh, 2015, I think, or 16, and that was to gain Kung Fu students. I was teaching Kung Fu uh, outdoors in the park, of course, as I have been since 1984, and I was teaching uh, classes at North Hollywood Park, uh, trying to actually even get my nonprofit Tai Chi Youth going. So I had uh, one of my students became the president of Tai Chi Youth, and we were trying to focus a lot of attention. So, what, you want to get down, little buddy? So anyway, look at that kitty. Nut. <laughs> Anyway, uh, he, um, we wanted to, uh, do you want to get down, bud? <laughs> Maybe not, I'll probably want to get back up. But anyway, um, during that time, I was trying all kinds of different ways to, well, just be successful. I'm an artist. I've always wanted to be successful. I'm always doing things, making records and music. And I got movies I wanted to make. I came up here and became homeless because I thought I was going to make the Kung Fu Cowboy movie. I thought I'd just live in my truck for a few months to get it going and then it would start rolling. We'd have enough money and I'd be able to live in a, on set, you know, in one of those trailers or something like that, make the movie, make some money, and then I'd be fine. <laughs> that was my game plan. 2012 and 2013 when I moved back to L.A. to make the Kung Fu Cowboy movies. But anyway... Uh, teaching Kung Fu since 1984, I became a Buddhist, and uh, uh, I was teaching Buddhism, and I just really embraced it, and taught, I, I studied lots of other religions, too, and we'll get into that, but in this particular video right now, let's just talk about the Four Noble Truths. Okay, so why am I saying all this? Well, it, it kind of evolved, the book evolved, and there's a couple of good stories I've got about a couple of good books, and uh, <laughs> not my better glasses. Anyway, the... Um, um, I had been working at a couple of nightclubs, the Ha Ha Club and stuff, doing my Kung Fu Cowboy routine. And uh, the problem is I wanted to tell jokes and then uh, and play the flute. And then that kind of evolved into um, doing poetry readings. And so for the poetry readings, I didn't want to tell the boring readings like these, uh, you know, these bored housewives, you know, and people out of work, <laughs> make them poetry. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't very inspired by very many other people's poetry. Uh, there were one out of 10, one out of 10 I'd, I'd find interesting and valuable, you know, somebody I'd like to be on the show with. But I uh, had to sit through a lot of other poetry I didn't really like. And um, <laughs> I see this one lady, every, every uh, month she would go up and perform and uh, every poem she'd have would be about love, love, love. It was, just, it was kind of funny. You could just kind of predict what was going to be the next poem. Uh, but anyway, um, I, so I started telling, I started doing my poetry readings all around LA. And so I researched it and I, I had a kind of pseudo manager. One of my students was trying to be my manager, Oscar Barrera. And so we figured out all the different nightclubs that I could do my poetry at. And then as I started to do my poetry and I tried to make it comical, so I was still doing the comedy. I was trying to be kind of like an intellectual philo philosophical comedian. That's what I wanted to be. I was a philosophical poet, a poet philosopher. And, uh, but with comedy. And uh, it got funny. And then I realized I wanted to play the flute because I really wanted to do music and I couldn't find places to perform. And so I discovered that I could not, none of the comedy clubs uh, would allow me to play an instrument because over the years, all kinds of people have been bringing things and bashing them and doing all kinds of messy things and maybe even dangerous with instruments. So most all the comedy clubs have banned playing musical instruments when you're performing comedy. <laughs> Seriously. If you ever see a comedian with an instrument, that's very, very rare. And I don't know how they got, got developed that, at least not in the small level, because all the little clubs won't let you do that. So anyway, I, I discovered that uh, I could play poetry. I could play my flute at the poetry readings. And I asked, asked permission. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure because nobody else was doing it. 
absolutely no one else. I don't think I ever performed a show where somebody played an instrument. I was the only one I ever saw in a couple of years I did it. So anyway, um, eventually I started doing the poetry and then I added the flute and all of a sudden, okay, well that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do, I get, you get like a three to five minute window depending on the venue and that's it. So I'd have to do a quick poem, you know, a couple minute poem and then I'd play a couple minutes on flute and get out in five minutes. And uh, so that was, that's the little slot you get on those open mic things, okay? I, um, when you're a featured poet, like I was once, uh, then you get a whole half an hour, and that's really awesome. I had a whole half an hour show, and that's a big story. Um, that's called the Kent State Murder Day. But anyway, I've got a whole show that I developed for being a featured poet. But anyway, getting back to the Four Noble Truths. Well, anyway, as I was writing this poetry, a lot of my poetry was coming out telling Buddhism. I was telling the stories of Buddhism and about Buddhism and uh, how Buddhism works. And I was even telling stories about Buddha back in his lifetime. And so... Um, I, I ended up with all this Buddhist poetry and I started to realize after a, a year of performing that I really wanted to kind of now form, narrow my niche. I was going to play flute, you know, and I was going to do poetry and it was going to be comical, but I wanted to now kind of focus in on the Buddhism. And so um, in my second year, evidently in December of 2018, having started in 2017, and really 2015 is when the whole thing started, but I really got my act together in 2017. Uh, so in 2018, I started a new book of poetry. I was carrying out, I got another, like two more of these books of, you know, because I was writing poetry all the time. So I create these books. These are like a per performance book. And what I would do is you'll see me in pictures back then. I always wore those uh, fanny packs. And my fanny pack always had my poetry book. And I had to get a fanny pack that was big enough to fit my poetry book in. And I'd get a poetry book that would fit my fanny pack. <laughs> so that was my lifestyle for, I don't know, what are we talking about? Like six, seven years was always carrying a book of poetry with me and writing a book of poetry. And so anyway, during the year of 2018, I decided I was going to focus on, on, on Buddhist poetry. And I created this, this particular book. Um, it's the uh, Four Noble Truths Explained. And uh, what I started to realize is I was telling all these things about the noble truths and about how Buddhism works and uh, the benefits and ways that it, you know, can make you smarter. And uh, I realized, well, let's, let's just really focus in on <clears throat> really explaining what Buddhism is. And uh, so anyway, this is the uh, <laughs> RDC Black Book, it's called. This book is RDC Black Book, a Buddha Z. So I was actually kind of going as Buddha Z. So I was Richard Del Connor, the philosopher poet. And that's what I, who I was when I released my poetry book in 2019. Uh, so I was the philosopher poet. Uh, but I was starting to branch off and thinking about being a Buddhist Z and being a Buddhist poet. And so this was the poetry I was doing for a while. I don't think anybody noticed. They just thought I was still the poet. I just signed in as Richard Del Connor, philosopher, poet. <laughs> so if you ever seen any of his sign-ins, I always put philosopher, poet, too, because I wanted that, that introduction. Um, anyway, this book says, original poems are copied into this notebook. So I'd write them on another piece of paper, and then I'd slightly edit them and put them into here to perform. Some minor changes often occur that make these poems significantly better than the original poems. However, the original poems sometimes contain politically incorrect <laughs> words and animosity edited out. Importantly, these poems are ready to be published and performed. And I got my little Buddha Z signature here too. And uh, so I've got a signature for everything. There's even a Kung Fu Cowboy signature. Um, okay, so anyway... I, I created this little book, and here's, a, here's the table of contents. These are all the poems that are in it. And uh, so anyway, these are all the poems. And so by the time I was done, I was like, okay, now well, what am I going to do about publishing these things? And, and I started to look through, and I created this um, uh, other book. In fact, uh, some of the titles here are kind of interesting. Um, it starts off with Origin of Suffering, Part 1. And that is the, the first, there's the Four Noble Truths, one, two, three, four, are life has suffering in it, and that's it, you know, you gotta accept that. And you can't be superstitious. A lot of times, like even, even this thing on my arm, I got a blown out vein. Look at that thing, isn't that thing ugly? I, I went for a, um, a blood test because I got a surgery this Wednesday. And now, if I was superstitious, I, you know, because these things do go through my head. But I'm not superstitious, but man, what a, this is not <laughs> that is <laughs> that is not a precursor of something. You know, anyway, you don't want to think of things in superstitiously. So you got to think of bad luck. There's like what what happened here. In fact, I'm going to take responsibility for that because I was talking to the lady. In fact, I was telling her, oh, she was asking me which arm, and I said, well, just make yourself comfortable. Do whatever's best for you. And I think I made her too comfortable, and she uh, blew out my arm. <laughs> so I sort of like let her just be kind of like professional and, and not not made her try to relax and enjoy your job so much. So that was kind of my fault in a weird, weird way. But anyway, um, life has suffering in it. So things happen. 
Now, second is that all suffering ends. Well, then, in other words, I got to figure, okay, this thing's going to go away. It's, you know, it's eventually going to fade out and go away. So that's the ending. Um, and so then the third thing is, is that um, how can I have an effect on it? Well, I'd like to, I've been thinking about, it. I've only done a couple of times, put some deep dodge out on it. I'm not sure if I should massage it. I don't want to irritate it. I'm actually not a real bruise expert because we don't have combat and sparring in any of my Kung Fu schools. So the bruising we do have or have had over the years, deep da jiao, which is an herbal liniment that I make, you know, based on a Chinese recipe, uh, really makes bruising go away. So I'm going to have to start putting it on there. But, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm in somebody else's care, so I didn't really want to interfere, but man, that thing's ugly. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't planning on showing that to you. Uh, this is a non-scripted video here. Anyway, um, the, um, so this thing starts with the origin. Oh, I was going to tell you what the Four Noble Truths are. Life has suffering and all suffering ends. So I'm figuring that's going to go away eventually, okay? Uh, and then three is that I can have an effect on the ending. And that's what I was saying. Maybe I can make it go a little quicker if I add something to it or should I just ignore it? I'm not actually sure. And maybe next time. And then four is how do you live a life with less suffering? And as I said, well, next time I go to get a blood test, I'm not going to talk to the lady when she's taking my blood. <laughs> Because I think she jittered and, and poked a hole in my vein with a needle. So I think I got her too relaxed. <laughs> so, so in the future, you see, that's now number four is be a little smarter. Number four is don't talk to the lady when she's taking your blood. I say lady. It has been a man a couple of times. Um, okay. Um, anyway, so that's the origin of stuffing. It starts off this whole, this book. This is a performance book. I wasn't really making this a publishing book. Uh, well, I was kind of, actually. I take that back because I even made a copyright thing in the beginning of it, you know, like I do in all my books. Um, the second one is Menudo Man, which is about President Trump. And it's a uh, really short little poem. Uh, Menudo Man, he thinks with his gut. It's bigger than most, so he must be smart. Good thing he doesn't think with his butt. I'd rather hear him burp than politically fart. <laughs> Unfortunately, we did get a lot of farting. Uh, but anyway, that was written to Trump back in, well, when... Uh, 18 or something, 2008. Yeah, 2018 is when this book started. So anyway, um, and, and all these books are kind of in the order that they were written. And so this became kind of a, a, a weird, an interesting little book. And then as I realized later, and I was still accumulating more, more poems, I said, well, what do I do with all this Buddhist stuff? You know, it's all, you know, it's all different order. It's not in any type of order. There's, there's a, a truth number one and a truth number four, and then these stories that illuminate them. And I thought, maybe I should make it so it's understandable. So it makes sense to me, but if it doesn't make sense to everybody else, then it's not as much value. And so that's kind of my goal is how do I make this value? How, how do I actually make this work for you? So that, that's been my, my, goals in almost all my books now is I'm trying to think, okay, I've made them for me. Now, how do I make them for you? <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I decided, okay, well, if I'm going to break this one down and, uh, oh, here, here, look at this. what I say? Bernie for, a uh, and Bernie for something here. I, I, I got some political thing. Oh, it says Bernie for secretary of state. And what would he get? He got something, he got something else that's very important. But anyway, that's what I was recommending. I was thinking, Bernie, stop being trying to go for president and go for something that's going to be a powerful position in the government. Hey, and that's what he did. So I'm glad I don't think I influenced him there, though. Uh, although I did make him a couple of videos and told him that I could give him some good advice because I think that uh, uh, I had some really good advice that could have helped his campaign. But I don't, anyway, we'll get politics. I've always tried to stay out of politics, but man, I just couldn't avoid it the last couple, the last four years of Trump. It's actually right now a couple days after the inauguration of Biden. It's like January 22nd today. So anyway, getting back to this. Um, so the Four Noble Truths. So what happened to that book, The Four Noble Truths? I was telling everybody, I was all excited. Hey, I'm going to make Buddhism uh, doable for you. You're going to really understand what it is. Well, I had to break it down into eight levels. I came to realize if anybody's going to understand that I really need to break it down. So the first one's going to be kind of like I planned. I'll just throw out a bunch of this poetry and stories and get you kind of warmed up to the idea, and they're kind of fun stuff, you know, just to get you an introduction. I call it the Four Noble Truths Introduction. That's going to be book one. So that book's written. I just got to, like, edit it and put it out there. Book number two now is about noble truth number one. Now, life is suffering. And so then I can put all the poetry that really relates to life being suffering. And so that's kind of cool. Um, and then I broke out then uh, the next one, Noble Truth Number Two, which is, of course, All Suffering Ends. So I write poetry about that. And then the... Next one is double truth number three. And remember, that's where you can have an effect on your future and suffering and the way things affect you and, and influence you. You can avoid them entirely so you don't have to deal with them. Um, and then um, noble truth number four is a lifestyle of, of whether you're going to 
blaze through trouble? Or are you going to go around it? You're going to deal with it? You're going to pay them all off? You're going to deal, you gotta do something, make your life better. So from whatever's happened to you, the life you lead forward with that knowledge and experience and wisdom is, is number four. And that's it. That's what it takes to be a Buddhist. You got to live by those four values. You got to accept that you're going to make a mistake or something's going to happen. It's going to end. You can affect it. And then you can leave, leave a, live a life where you affect it in a positive way and you're happy as can be. So that's the whole essence of Buddhism. That's it. Every other lesson in Buddhism is to clarify that and help you master those four things because that's it. That's the whole root of all Buddhism. And nobody tells you that. <laughs> I mean, they kind of do. Even the Dalai Lama wrote a book about the Four Noble Truths. I've got it. It's a good book. And everybody writes a book different. Like my book's different. My book's got all kinds of poetry and rock and roll and politics and stuff in it, you know? So everybody's got their own slant on Buddhism and the Four Noble Truths and how they represent or portray it. So... They're all good. I, I recommend reading everybody's book. on the. I, I've got a half a dozen or more books that I've accumulated just in the last few years to see what other people were doing. And uh, I like them all in different ways. They're all good in some way or another. And uh, so anyway, <clears throat> and then the next one is, okay, so then I thought, okay, so I've introduced you to them. I've explained each of the levels. So what? You know, so what? Now you got all this great information. Um, well, I decided that's not good enough. That's not good enough. What I got to do is I got to make it so you can use it. You can benefit from it. You can, un maybe you kind of barely understand it. Well, maybe you got to be able to understand it in terms of your life, your world, your, you, whatever you want and desire in life. Oh, there's that word desire. Buddhism isn't about getting rid of desires. It's about basically making your desires come true. Be realistic. If your desires aren't going to work, then throw them in the trash. But if you've got good desires, then keep working at them and use the Four Noble Truths to make them happen. That's what Buddhism is really about. Um, in fact, that's the whole idea. Everybody should become a Buddha. You should be able to live a life of minimal suffering and high success. You know, that's, that's a Buddhist. Less suffering and more success. Hey, happy Buddhist. Okay, so anyway, um, so I decided the last three, uh, three books were going to be about um, how to use them. And so the way I did them here on, on, on this first outline, we'll see how this comes to fruition as, as I actually publish these books. It's going to be the path to nirvana. Okay, everybody likes to think of that nirvana and that heaven. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a kind of peace of mind, a kind of um, enjoyment of life, a contentment, a satisfaction, a, even, even luxury to a, a certain extent. Okay, everybody should want a little bit of comfort and security and uh, luxury. The next one is, um, okay, so it's just about your path, how to, how to develop a path to, to having a nice life. Then the second one is, uh, so, oh, that's all, actually the name of that title, it looks like, is Becoming a Bodhisattva. What's a Bodhisattva? Well, a Bodhisattva, the Bodhi tree, is the tree that um, Buddha sat underneath when he became enlightened, when he discovered the Four Noble Truths. When he discovered the Four Noble Truths, he was sitting under this tree. And so everybody says, oh, what a great tree. That's where he became smart. <laughs> I think they're giving the tree extra credit. But anyway, Bodhi was the name of the tree or the style or the breed or whatever. I actually don't know a whole lot about it. In fact, the tree that was there, they live hundreds of years or even a thousand years. But I think that the one that's there is not the original Bodhi tree that was there when Buddha was there 2,500 years ago. I, I, I don't think it is. If uh, from what I remember reading, this one is only well, it's at least maybe fifteen hundred years old. It's really, really, really old. The one that's there though right now. Okay, so that's pretty old, uh, even for a tree. So anyway, um, so a bodhisattva, bodhi. So the bodhi tree and a sattva. Um, I actually don't know the translation right off the top of my head, but a bodhisattva is basically someone who's. Achieved enlightenment, kind of like me. I know what it takes to be happy. I understand reality and, and nature and, and uh, human behavior and psychology and right and wrong and, uh, and four noble truths. And so it's like, okay, everything makes sense to me now. In fact, the only thing that didn't make sense to me was a lot of people's behavior. I couldn't understand why people wouldn't think like me or react like me. They give them the same information. Well, why don't you see it the same way I do? And, and there was a few psychological things that I was unable to figure out until about a few years ago. And so that kind of trumped this thing and kind of in a way pushed it off to the side, even though it's kind of at least partially done, you know, if the first couple books are maybe written. But um, my, my emphasis on this, because I uh, came, across, came across a new theory about three years ago. Uh, well, actually back in 2012 and thir well, it was 2013, because I called the book Super Soul 
13. And it's about how in 2013 I was studying the Vedic scriptures and the Bhagavad Gita. And I learned all about the fact that we all have two souls, not one soul. In other words, it's not just you, you know, and you want to think of life after death. Okay, go ahead. I, I actually go along with that. Even though I'm a scientist, even though I'm a scientist, and I'm willing to say, you know, take both sides of the fence. But, um, but it, uh, they say that you had a second soul, and that's a soul of God. And so, in other words, that's how you know when you do right and wrong, because the soul of God is, get, you know, it's like, formed in his character. And then you got your blank slate. <laughs> so then when you do things that are opposite of this guy that he doesn't like, then you feel like, oh, I'm getting away from God. If you do something nice, then you're getting closer. And the uh, Muslims have something similar in which they say that when you're born, you have the breath of God in you. And so that little essence of God in you, that other little soul, you know, is when you know you're doing right and wrong because you can tell when you're not harmonizing with the essence of God. So that's kind of a core of the Muslim religion too. So anyway, that, those, that concept was in me in several different ways. And I was raised Catholic and I'm a Native American. Uh, so anyway, the... Um, okay. So what I did was I came across this brand new theory called the five... I call it the five souls of God. And I tested on people. The word God's really come... Kind of, lost a lot of popularity. <laughs> He's got a bad rep, kind of like our last president. Uh, people don't think, think much of God. That's, that's a good analogy, unfortunately. Although I, I really don't want to, Trump, well, you know, if we're all a piece of God. Even Trump is God. Then God, you're going to have to clean your act up. Okay, so anyway, I came up with this book called The Five Souls of God. And the book is based on the fact that everybody has four souls. You're actually born with three. And it's kind of complicated. And, and the orders and, and everything, I figured the whole thing out. Now everything makes sense. And I'm sorry for getting dis diverting off on that. But that's actually what's actually circumvented my, in, my, uh, <laughs> my efforts on this book. Because I've been working on the Five Souls book. The first one's 660 pages. And it's totally handwritten. And I've got it ready to go, ready to publish right now. So, well, actually, I got it out edited. I got to put it in there, and then I'll typeset it on the other side. So 660 pages, which really makes it, what, 330 pages if I did it two-sided. But it's going to be handwritten on one side and then uh, printed on the, on the other side. Just the same way I did my philosopher-poet book. Okay, so anyway, so bodhisattva is that you could be a Buddha. Ah, I got to get it. Anyway, um, like I said, unscripted here. The... Um, Bodhisattva is basically you learned it all, you got it all, and now you're just going to live and enjoy your life and help other people. Now, the helping other people, I think, is a part of being a Bodhisattva as opposed to just being smarter. So that's, that's I think, what makes it a little different. Now, the next one, the seventh book, is Becoming a Buddha. Everybody thinks you've got to like, raise the dead or something to be a Buddha. But Buddha just means you know the Four Noble Truths. As soon as you learn those Four Noble Truths, you're a Buddha. That's it. That's it. You got it. You got it. That's Buddhism. Buddhism is to teach you the Four Noble Truths. Now, of course... Um, uh, when the original Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was teaching, he realized that these people were following him around. He was talking to them and teaching them, but they still realized that they didn't quite have it. And they were going off and sharing his ideas and, you know, having dinner with people to get free food, because that's, or free food, any food. <laughs> and they would share Buddhist words, and they were, they were passing along a lot of this information. But he realized that none of these guys were as really as equal. None of these guys he thought were really, could really represent him. Just a few. In fact, actually maybe five. And then maybe a few more. I, I'm breaking this all down because I'm actually going to make a rock opera on it. Well, I'm actually making it. It's like half done. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's going to be about Buddha. It's going to be cool. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to have all the, the, the interesting parts of his life, the assassinations, the, uh, the sex. and the, There's going to be some interesting things. There are. There are murders and stuff, right, in his life and in in going around around him. But most people don't know these stories. Okay, so anyway, becoming a Buddha is number seven. So in other words, you actually now are a Buddha, which means, do you know what it means? It just means enlightened one. It just means somebody who's learned something really cool and smart and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and has improved their life with it. Okay, the last one is a life of meaning. I kind of like that. It's inspired by the millennial concept of, uh, unfortunately, without sports and without a lot of the things that we were raised with um, in my generations, the baby boomers, uh, the current generations aren't given even false hopes and the false concepts or even the, the ability to, to have those team goals and concepts. They're, they're, they, have a different, they haven't developed a lot of the motivations that I take for granted. And so a life of meaning is really more difficult for people who haven't had a, a kind of a purpose and a team spirit or something because that gives you little meanings and temporary things. So they haven't had as many goals structured in their life. So anyway, this last one is trying, okay, so how can I do this? How can I take all this Buddhism? How can I take all this information, all this understanding, all these stories and experiences of real people, and then make it so you can understand them, 
Make them so you can see them in your own life, in your own way. And then lastly, how you can basically live a, a life and uh, uh, live a life of meaning. <laughs> Be a Buddha. So anyway, that's, that's the four double truths. And so anyway, those are coming to you. And I, I, I made this video because I really wanted to give an update. And people have been asking about it. And I've been talking about it for years. And it's going to come about. I'm, like I said, I'm very distracted by my Five Souls book. I really, they're, they're kind of in con conflict. And they're not. They're not in conflict in terms of information, but in terms of me being able to work or publish. or prom I actually, right now, in the last, um, in December, it's January now, 2021. In December, I just published my first audio book. Okay, so great. But I've sold five copies. <laughs> I'm so unsuccessful. So anyway, I got this great audio book. And I got to tell you, I think it's really, really good. And it's my first one. And I'm going to get better and better. But the fact is, I started off really, really good. And this is called Masonic Kung Fu. And I wrote the book. And I narrated it. So it's, it's really kind of good. And uh, yeah, you should uh, go get it. Get the paperback, too, if you want. Uh, uh, I recommend it. The paperback and the audiobook. I'm very, very proud of them. And then right after that, I released my poetry book, Philosopher Poet in a Field of Dreams. I got the paperback. I've recorded the audiobook, but I haven't released it. So come on, get out there and get some of my stuff. <laughs> it's worth it. I mean, it's not just stuff. It's, it's actually stuff to make you smarter. So that's why I don't sell anything. People aren't trying to be smarter. I don't know anybody who's like, hey, you know how I can be smarter today? We live in a pretty... What do we call this? A bovine world. Okay, so anyway, I wanted to give you that quick update on the uh, Four Noble Truths. It's coming. Now you kind of understand what it is. It's going to be eight book series over eight years. So um, my goal is to release this book every year and with the numbers 2021. I want to make this level the, the first one. So I'm really hoping that somehow this year, 2021, I'll get you this first book of the Four Noble Truths out. But I don't want to make that promise. Now, Buddha's birthday is April. That'd be a good day to get it out by. So we'll see. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, Buddha Jen, Jen Shenlong. And uh, just wanted to give you that quick update, let you know, and maybe warm you up to the concept that this is going to be a great book. And, and I'm hope well, it's going to work. It's going to, if you read this book, you're going to be a little smarter and you're going to be a little more capable of dealing with reality in, in new ways. I'm going to give you new ways to think and hopefully entertain you and make you giggle a little few times and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I took some of the more offensive stuff out, you know, a little, being a little, rawr, 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 you know, kind of hopefully a little bit. Then again, you know, that's part of life, you know. You, but thinking with your emotions is not. That's animalistic. So in Buddhism, we're trying to raise ourselves to a, a higher conscious level, mind level, not emotional level, mind level. <clears throat> so that's why we have the thing of, against desires and emotions is because they make it harder to be smart. They make it harder to be rational. They make it harder to make good decisions. They make it easy to make mistakes. They make it easy to say things that you wish you didn't say. See, they make you stupid. So emotions are kind of what we go against. But that doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge the fact that everybody has them. You just got to control them. And you just got to acknowledge them and put them back in their box. <laughs> okay? All right? So anyway, Buddha Jen Shen Long, Richard Del Connor uh, from Shaolin Communications. Oh, I'm here in our... Um, our, our Lancaster Kwun, our Kung Fu school, where I'm teaching Shaolin Kung Fu, as you can see. I, I got a little <clears throat> thing of Buddha up here. That's why I kind of positioned the camera in this particular area of this wall, which is all covered with weapons all the way up and down. And is I, I picked this spot because we got Buddha up here. And this is the monk spade of Bodhidharma. So this represents the patriarch of Zen Buddhism, you know, because he created Kung Fu and Buddhism together. And only at the Shaolin Temple did this evolve. Because they had the shovel for burying the dead, you know. And then... When they became warrior monks, they said, well, a shovel is not as good to fight with if it's not balanced. So they put this on the other end, and now you can take people off horseback. You know, you can kind of clip off limbs and heads as they drive by. So um, this became the, uh, uh, the Zen Buddhist, for me, it's kind of like the Zen Buddhist symbol. <laughs> In fact, when you get to the top level of my Buddhist Kung Fu school, Shaolin Chi Mantis, Shaolin Kung Fu, Yang Tai Chi, and Northern Praying Mantis. Uh, that's, the, that's the weapon you get for a Kung Fu master. So you got to learn that one. Same in way. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll teach it to some people, hopefully. And, uh, oh, that's, this is the whip chain. And, uh, yeah, uh, zenbuddhistpodcast.com. I'm putting out all the old ones. I'm going to start some new ones. And I'm going to really say what Zen Buddhism is. Because the fact is, is most people don't know what Zen Buddhism is. Um, Zen Buddhism has no chanting. Oh, they got chanting in that. Oh, is it really Zen? Uh, Zen Buddhism has no icons. What? <laughs> Zen Buddhism, it has no statues. It has no gods. It has all these, it, it doesn't have all these things that for some reason it suddenly does. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to take you back. I'm going to be the Martin Luther of, uh, you know, the guy who renovated 
Catholicism and created the Lutheran religion because they were selling God and they were kind of like exaggerating things. So that's kind of what I am. <clears throat> I'm, I'm taking the new Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and saying, okay, you guys have got a whole bunch of stuff in here that doesn't belong here. Let's get back to the real stuff, the core of it. So that's what I'm doing. And so in my Buddhism, even my original Buddhism, this stuff here, this one that's coming from him, that guy, Siddhartha Gautama, the original Buddha. That's actually given me by some uh, Buddhist monks from Tibet. And uh, when I was in Utah, when all the monks had come through, everybody knew me as the, as the hippie Buddhist. So uh, the Shaolin Buddhist, Kung Fu, Tai Chi Buddha, they had all kinds of names for me. <laughs> but anyway, so whenever the monks came to town, they'd tell them I get a phone call, hey, there's some monks in town. Oh, okay, I'd go meet them and hang out with them. And uh, anyway, a couple, some of them would come back each year. And so I got to know a few of them, and that was a present. But anyway, the... Uh, Got a few, but anyway, okay, anyway, just wanted to share this stuff with you. Oh, and again, in terms of uh, the real temple and the monks and all these religions and stuff, I can give you some perspectives on that too. But basically, my goal is to go back to the core and make it usable. I'm not going to sell you any, I'm not trying to sell a membership. I'm not trying to sell you any afterlife. I'm just trying to sell you how to be happy in this life and how to be smarter. Don't you want to be happier and smarter? <laughs> <laughs> Almost put my middle finger up there. <laughs> anyway, you want to be happier and smarter. Okay, so anyway, that was it. I, I got to end this because what is it, 30 minutes now? Ah, I thought it was going to be about 10 minutes. So here we go. Now you got a little story about the Four Noble Truths and the books that I'm going to put out. It's going to be an eight book series, hopefully with the first one this year, 2021. It's written. I just got to get to it. I got so many things going. Um, Anyway, if I can get it to you, I will. And so zenbuddhistpodcast.com is the uh, website where actually I'm putting this video for the first place and I'll have it in other places. So if you got it right, maybe, you, maybe you're at Zen Buddhist Podcast. Get those podcasts, enjoy them. I got a whole bunch more. Oh, that's what I was starting to say is when I do my new podcast, I'm going to start playing with these, a lot of these weapons that are all around me. <laughs> I'm going to pull out a sword over here. I got swords over here. and You can't see them. Sword down here. <laughs> the sword there. I got... Pretty sexy. I just said camera. Should I, should I take a risk here? Anyway, we move down the wall here. You can see a bunch more weapons and swords. See them down there. And stuff down here. And goes over there. <laughs> oh, there's a mug spade way up there. So anyway, yeah, there's a... Anyway, there you go. Um, here we go. That's. I don't know what this is. I think it was supposed to be kind of like a commercial for the... But it's... An infomercial. So anyway, have a great, uh, have a great day. Have a great life. Somebody just said that recently, and he didn't mean it. <laughs> so I, I choked when I started to say that. Uh, so anyway, um, but my goal is to help you to have a great life. Help you help help make it happen. And I write poetry. I write a lot of poetry. And and I was thinking in poetry during those years. My mind kind of like can orient itself in different ways. And uh, look at this. I mean, that's my rough draft. And there's no, because if you go over here, I mean, when I finally went to. Edit it down. Yeah, see, I made some changes. There's a little bit of editing there. But no, basically, I, I've got an ability to, to really think poetry. I'm not a rapper, although, well, I am kind of. I'm actually thinking, I've, well, I've been trying since 2015. I've been writing some poetry and some little kind of aggressive stuff. And I was thinking about trying to sell it to some other rap artists, but I couldn't find anybody. So I've got an identity of Buddha Z, the, the Buddhist rapper, or doing Buddhist rap, or non-rap, I'm not sure what they call it. But I was willing to, for fun, use my poetry and heavy metal music and do something to, you know, be unique and actually give somebody some smart information. So I've recorded some songs. I've actually got one of them, Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, and it's a rap song. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> let me get out of here. 33 minutes now. Okay. Uh, Buddha Jen, letting you know that the Four Noble Truths books is an eight-book series now, and it will be coming soon to a theater near you or bookstore or at least my website. You'll at least find it there. And by the way, well, I'm not going to get you into all that stuff. Okay, see you later. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. This is the way I always end all my performances, and you can only do this if you are an actual Shaolin Zen Buddhist. That's why I'm a little reluctant to do it now because I don't people imitating it don't even know what it is. This represents me being a disciple of the original disciple of Zen Buddhism, Hui Ke, of uh, disciple of Bodhidharma. And so, anyway, there you go, I did. <laughs>